to yourself living here. Oh, my name is... Oh. <laughs> So tonight, escapism at 8.30, comedy later, and coming up next on BBC Two, a brand new university challenge. From the dawn of technology... This axe is the most sophisticated object on the planet. ..to the first words... Dashi! ..Agasta are the first of our ancestors to have a human voice. Witness the birth of modern man. Their insight into their surroundings is nothing short of revolution. As our human journey continues... Come Walking with Cavemen, Thursday at 8 on BBC One. All right. All right, mate. Uh, come round to watch eight BBC channels. What, all at once? For your free guide, call 08700 10 10 10. You're watching BBC Two and the professionals with designs on winning University Challenge. University Challenge, the professionals. Asking the questions, Jeremy Paxman. Hello, tonight we continue our search for the British profession or institution which is able to field the brainiest team of four people. The Royal Society is the UK's National Academy of the Sciences. It emerged in the mid-17th century and is the oldest scientific body in the world. Fellowship is considered one of the world's highest academic distinctions and is currently held by around 1,300 scientists from all disciplines. Past members include Samuel Pepys, Christopher Wren and Isaac Newton, who are no doubt gazing down in hopeful expectation on tonight's four. Let's meet them. Hello, I'm Mike Towler. I'm a research fellow in theoretical physics at Cambridge University and I'm a college lecturer at Emmanuel College. Hello, I'm Harriet McWatters. I'm a research fellow in plant sciences at University of Oxford. And their captain? I'm Bob Michel. I'm a research professor in biosciences at the University of Birmingham. Hello, I'm Martin Castell. I'm a university research fellow in materials at the University of Oxford. Now, members of the society work throughout the UK, but uh, let's see them at the society's headquarters in London. Scientists stereotypically are often thought of as uh, mad professors or people who want to take over the world. Um, that's not really what they're like at all. They're generally very normal and ordinary people with broad interests, but who happen to be fascinated by answering particular questions about how the world works. I enjoy the excitement of discovering something completely new that no one else has seen before. Sometimes if this happens, I'll invite someone else into the laboratory and I'll say, you're the second person who's seen this in the whole world. There was no particular motivation to appear on the show. Uh, I don't really want to be on it, to be honest. The Royal Society sent around an email asking all its fellows to fill in the answers to a quiz. Um, and I had nothing to do for 10 minutes, so I filled it in and sent it off without thinking through the implications. And unfortunately, I got more answers right than all but three of the others, and sadly, they asked me to be in the team, and I was too chicken to refuse. I think my family is supportive and highly amused that at this late stage, um, I finally managed to get through to University Challenge. Um, I haven't told many of my work colleagues, so they may well be surprised to see me there. I've always enjoyed watching the programme and pitting my wits against the people on the teams I see. Now I suppose I find out uh, whether I can do anything like it myself. Well, I think we'll do very well on the five or so questions about science in every show. 
but it's the 357 questions on arts and humanities that might be a problem. Well, we are all still at university, even though we are no longer students, but as with any trivia questions, you either know the answers or you don't. I can see the sun headline now. Mentally challenged top boffins defeated by brave fishermen. Now, the Royal Institute of British Architects aims to, quote, advance architecture by demonstrating its benefit to society and promoting excellence in the profession. Tonight's representatives hope their appearance will dispel the idea that the profession is populated, in their words, by egotistical workshy fops spending other people's money. They say that as architects are necessarily polymaths, their training should stand them in good stead tonight. Let's meet them. Hi, my name is Aidan Ridyard. I'm an architect from Telford in Shropshire and I also lecture at Birmingham School of Architecture. Hi, I'm David Boff. I'm a senior architect in a private practice in Telford. And there, Captain? Hello, I'm David Billingsley, an architect working in local government from Ceredigion in West Wales. Hello, I'm David Thomas, an architect from Machantleth in Mid Wales. Right, we took our architects for a short stroll outside this studio to see what they made of Salford's new buildings. I'm the captain of the architects team. When we heard that a new series of university challenges was being put forward, we decided to come out from behind our drawing boards and show that we could engage with the real world. The most rewarding thing about my profession is being able to walk onto a building site and witness the spaces that I've imagined in my head being turned into reality, into bricks, mortar, glass, concrete. Architects have a really bad stereotypical image. We can be arrogant and we can be opinionated, but then again, if you want to get anything done, you have to have an element of that. I think training as an architect has given me a broad knowledge of many fields ranging from art, science, law, politics and I think as a series of individuals we have many strengths in more specialised subjects. One of the weaknesses of the team will probably be science and although I studied it for a while at university I've forgotten most of it and uh, I seem to only know useless or trashy information. I'm looking forward to taking part in the competition. I've been watching University Challenge since I was a small boy and went next door to watch it with a neighbour. I think it's probably the best general knowledge quiz programme that there is on television and has been for a long time. It'll be a privilege to be able to take part in it. One of the reasons I'm looking forward to the University Challenge is to meet Jeremy Paxman face to face and uh, to come across his wit and see if he's as witty in real life as he is on the telly. At the moment, I haven't told very many of my colleagues and family about appearing on the show, mainly to avoid embarrassment. You know the scenario, get a question wrong and they'll be reminding you about it for years, but hopefully they'll all be tremendously excited when they see me. I think the reason I wanted to appear on the show was primarily curiosity. Um, uh, rather than shouting answers to the TV screen, I wanted to see if I could do it in the flesh, um, see if I was able to cope with the uh, acerbic Paxman wit in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Uh, time will tell if we can. <laughs> well, but before we begin, you all know the rules. Ten points for starters, 15 for bonuses. But remember, there's a five-point penalty for incorrect interruptions to starter questions. Fingers on the buzzers. Here's your first starter for ten. Three novels by Charles Dickens, including Bleak House, short stories by H. E. Bates, O. Henry, Saki and Somerset Maugham, works by Herman Hesse, Graham Greene and Evelyn War, including the Sword of Honour trilogy, and nine unnamed plays by Shakespeare, were linked by which avid reader in December 2002? He also listed works by John Mortimer, adding, I was in no doubt that Rumpel would have got me off. Uh, Architects Billingsley. Geoffrey Archer. Geoffrey Archer is correct, yes. <laughs> his reading list in prison. 
So you get the first set of bonuses there on pottery and porcelain manufacture. Firstly, for five, what name is given to the white clay, also called kaolin, formed from the natural weathering and decomposition of granites poor in iron oxides? China clay. Correct. What name is given to the creamy mixture of clay and minerals made into a slurry with water and used for casting objects in a mould for decorating objects or for joining pieces? Slip. Correct. What name is given to the body of a piece of pottery before it is glazed or, or which is left unglazed? The form? No, it's biscuit. Another starter question. Which word derives from the Latin for hump and is used to mean the phase of the moon when it is more than half but less than full? Tala. Uh, gibbous. Gibbous is correct, yes. you work that out from the Latin? No. <laughs> well, it was right anyway. Here are your bonuses. Three questions on Shakespeare and Rome. Which of Shakespeare's plays begins with the sons of the late emperor of Rome, Saturninus and Bassianus, confronting each other before the capital? Titus Andronicus. Titus Andronicus. Correct. Which of Shakespeare's Roman plays begins with a mob of citizens armed with clubs working themselves up to violence? Coriolanus. Coriolanus is right. In which of Shakespeare's plays are some scenes set in Philario's house in Rome and others in Wales at Milford Haven and at the cave of Bellarius? Cymbeline. Cymbeline is right. That takes you into the lead and another starter question. <laughs> Ten points for this. Who's being described? Born in Neshabar in what is now northeastern Iran in the 11th century, his surname means tent maker, probably after his father's occupation. Recognized as the outstanding mathematician of his time and appointed astronomer to Sultan Malik Shah, his achievements in the sciences have been eclipsed by the epigrammatic verse quatrains attributed to him. Royal Society McWatters. Omar Khayyam. It is Omar Khayyam, yes. <laughs> yes. So here are your bonuses, Royal Society. They're on architectural copies. The city of Paris in Texas and the Las Vegas Strip are both graced by replicas of which landmark, the original of which was erected for the World Fair of 1889? The Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower? Correct. A replica of the Arc de Triomphe can be seen on the Sochiawa Kiselev thoroughfare in which East European capital city? Bucharest, I think. Bucharest? Correct. Schloss. Herinkinse, a replica of the Palace of Versailles, was built in the 1870s by which king of Bavaria? Ludwig II. Ludwig II? Ludwig II? Yes, it was Mad King Ludwig. <laughs> Fingers on the buzzer is another starter question. In 2002, which artist was commissioned to create a Christmas tree for Tate Britain, but instead sent the tree to the charity Lighter? Royal Society McWatters. Tracy Emin. Tracy Emin is correct. Your bonuses are on scientific experimentation. Firstly, for five, which two American scientists give their names to the classic experiment of 1887, which attempted to measure the velocity of the Earth through a hypothetical medium in space called the ether, which carried light waves? Michelson Morley. Michelson Morley. Correct. Using a modified Michelson interferometer in the experiment, Michelson and Morley expected to see a shift in interference fringes when what action was performed in the interferometer? It was rotated. It was rotated. More? Mm -hmm. uh, by 90 degrees. Correct, yes. What explanation of the null result observed was given independently by the Dutch physicist Hendrik Antoon Lorentz and the Irish physicist George Edward Fitzgerald and was later given a theoretical basis in Einstein's special theory of relativity? Constancy of the speed of light. Constancy of the speed of light. No, it's a moving body contracts in the direction of its motion. That's what I was looking for. Right, we're going to take our first picture round. For your picture starter, you're going to see a painting of a man associated with Queen Elizabeth I. Ten points if you can name him. Uh, Architects Billingsley. Cecil. Hen um, Henry Cecil, is it? The first uh, Cecil to be uh, Chief Minister. Uh, no, I can't accept that. Royal Society.
So you get the picture bonuses, Royal Society. Uh, three more portraits of men associated with Elizabeth I. Five points for each correct answer. Here's the first. Robin Dudley? Uh, I think I'll accept this. Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, <laughs> yes. Here's the second. Walsingham. It is Sir Francis Walsingham, and finally. Really? No, it isn't. It's Robert Devereux of the Earl of Essex. Another starter question. You'll need to work this out before you buzz in. What is ten to the power one minus ten to the power zero? Royal Society Castell. Nine. Of course it is. Yes. <laughs> Here are your bonuses then, Royal Society. There are on unlikely Olympic nations. Which two countries sent a unified team to the Olympic Games in 1948 and, in a gesture of reconciliation, marched together in the opening ceremony of the Sydney Games? Israel and Palestine? No, it was North and South Korea. You're dreaming there. Uh, second well, for five well, points, <laughs> which German region sent its own team to the 1952 Games before achieving its status as the 10th land of West Germany in 1957? Is that Schleswig-Holstein? What did he think? He said she's a Westphalia, right? No, I don't. Schleswig-Holstein? No, it's Saarland. And finally, which autonomous area in the Middle East sent two athletes to the Games in 2000, one who took part in the men's 20-kilometre walk and a swimmer in the women's 50-metre freestyle? No idea. It was a West, Western African country, I think. Um, it was Eric the Eel. He was a swimmer. Is that right? Come on. No idea. No, it was Palestine that time. <laughs> right, another starter question from Possible 10. Which writer announced in 2002 that she planned to give up writing novels to concentrate on essays following mixed reviews of her second novel, The Autograph Man? Ah. Architects Billingsley. Zadie Smith. Zadie Smith is right, yes. <laughs> Here are your bonuses then, Architects. The Pylons is a poem by which author closely associated with Auden Day Lewis and McNeese? A group sometimes referred to as the Pylon Poets on account of the use they made in their work of modern industrial imagery. Is it uh, Stephen Spender? Correct. Which film of 1999 was written by Simon Beaufoy, starred Pete Postlethwaite and is set in Yorkshire, where a group of workmen are painting electricity pylons? In the Land of the Giants. In the Land of the Giants? No, it's Among Giants. Hmm. And finally for five, best known for the men in Gate and Lambeth Bridge, which architect was engaged by the Central Elect Electricity Board to advise on pylon design, recommending an American model which he modified with a broader base and gantries in three tiers? Gilbert Scott. No, it's Sir Reginald Blomfield. Right, with the scores on 35 and 100, we're about halfway through. We're going to take a music round for your music starter. You're going to hear an aria from one opera being sung over the music from another opera both by the same composer. Ten points if you can name the composer and both operas. Architects Billingsley. Is it Puccini? Yep. La Bohème and Tosca. Um, no, anyone to bust the Royal Society? You may not confer. Royal Society Tauler. Um, La Bohème and Madame Butterfly. No, it's Gianni Schicchi and Manon Lesco. Schicchi, sorry. And Manon Lesco. So we'll take the music bonuses when someone gets to start a question. Right, here it comes for ten points. Who or what is being described? A perfect organism, its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. The assessment continues. I admire its purity, its sense of survival, unclouded by conscience, remorse or ah, delusion. Architects Ridyard. The alien. The alien predator in the film of that name, yes. <laughs> So we're now going to have to endure some more of those awful uh, 
run together pieces of music. Uh, three more arias. Uh, in each case, name the composer and both operas. Here's the first. <laughs> We think it's Handel. Yep, you're right um, so far. Julius Caesar. No. It's Aria Dante and Asis and Galatea. Right, we'll take another one for five points. <laughs> Mozart, mm -hmm. uh, we think it's the Magic Flute and Don Giovanni. Uh, it's the Marriage of Figaro and Cosi Fan Tutti. Oh. Uh, you've got the composers right, though. <laughs> Finally, for five points. <laughs> Benjamin Britten. No, it's Johann Strauss. It's the laughing song from Deflated Mouse and the Gypsy Baron. Uh, we'll take the producer out and quietly put him down later. <laughs> right, start a question for possible ten. Which term originates with Cormac Teague McCarthy's equivocating responses to Elizabeth I's demands that he surrender his castle to her, prompting her to say he never means what he says, he never does what he promises. The term deriving from the name of McCarthy's court castle now refers to a beguiling eloquence. Uh, architects Rudyard. Blarney. Blarney is correct, yes. Your bonus is architects are on seven noses. A long-established but now discredited story suggested that the severing of which nose was caused by target practice by Napoleon's troops. 14th century iconoclasm is now believed to be a likelier cause. Is it the nose on the sphinx? It is indeed at Giza. Later turned into an opera by Shostakovich, who's, which 19th century Russian writer's story the nose tells of the barber Ivan Yakovlevich, who discovers a severed nose in his breakfast roll? Pushkin. No, it's Gogol. In which of Woody Allen's films do the hero and heroine find themselves having to make a clone of a dictator from his severed nose? Yes. Love and Death? No, it's Sleeper. Another starter question. Which portion of the electromagnetic spectrum lies between the wavelengths of about 400 and 200 nanometers and is divided into three regions denoted by the letters A, B and C? Royal Society, Michelle. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is right. If you hadn't got that right, you'd never be able to land in the building. Right, your bonus is Royal Society are on commercial art. In 1919, the illustrator Will Owen produced an enormously successful advertising poster depicting two street urchins passing an open window and smelling the aroma of a baked pie inside. With which two words was the work captioned? Arbisto? Arbisto is right. Born in 1928, which artist specialised in advertisements for shoes, making him one of the most financially successful artists in New York by the end of the 50s, after which he became a leading exponent of pop art? Just being an ex hmm? Andy, Warhol. Andy Warhol. Correct. Born 1898, which surrealist early commercial work included illustrations for the advertising industry and motifs for wallpaper before his first exhibition in Brussels in 1927? Dali? No, it's René Magritte. We're going to take our second picture round now. You're going to see the cover of a book from which we've removed the wording. Ten points if you can tell me the author's name. Here it is. Royal Society McWatters. It's Ian Banks. It is. It, let's see the whole thing. Complicity. So for your picture bonuses, you're going to see three more examples of Peter Brown's artwork for Ian Banks' novels. I want the title of the book in each case. Here's the first for five. 
wit. Yes, it is. Let's see the whole thing. There it is. Here's the second coming up now. The bridge. The bridge is indeed right. There it is. And finally... I'll nominate Waters. I think it's Espadier Street, but I'm not certain. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's Espadier Street, Espadier <laughs> Street or something like that, but you're absolutely spot on. Well done. <laughs> OK, there are four minutes to go. Ten points for this. Popular during the Regency period and associated with the work of George Hepplewhite, among others, what name is given to a chair in which the design of the back... Uh, architect's bath. Shield back. I'm afraid you lose five points. The design of the back consists of an adaptation of a musical instrument from classical times. Now, you may not confer. I'll tell you, it's a lyreback chair. Another starter question. T cells are the principal agents of cell... Royal Society, Michelle. The, the immune system? No, you lose five points. The principal agents of cell-mediated immunity and are so named because, although derived from bone marrow, they migrate to which organ of the body to mature? Uh, architect's bath. The liver. No, it's the thymus. So, another starter question. Which controversial test of eye irritancy used particularly on rabbits by the pharmaceuticals and cosmetics industry... Royal Society McWatters. The Ames test. No, you lose five points. Pharmaceuticals and cosmetics industry is named after the scientists who developed it in 1944. No, architect, it's the Dray's test after J.H. Dray's. Another starter question. When it rains... The in December 2002, saying that it offered their wives a hideous sartorial destiny. Royal Society McWatters. Members of the Church of England? Nope. Anyone want to buzz <laughs> from the architects? Uh, architects Ridyard. Greek Orthodox. Greek Orthodox clergy is correct. <laughs> Three questions on fluid viscosity for your bonuses. Which Swift mathematician first derived the theorem named after him, which implies that in a horizontally flowing fluid, a decrease in fluid pressure is accompanied by an increase in fluid velocity? Venturi? Uh, no, it's Danielle Benoui. Which dimensionless number is named after the British engineer and physicist who in 1883 demonstrated that the transition from laminar to turbulent flow in a pipe depends on the value of that number equal to the speed of flow times the diameter of the pipe times the density divided by its viscosity? It's not pi, is it? No, it's, Re <laughs> no, it's not. It's <laughs> Reynolds number. Which British physicist and mathematician is particularly noted for his law of viscosity, which describes the motion of a solid sphere falling in a viscous fluid? Come on, there's any more to go. No, it's Stokes. Another starter question. Which annual publication reports in its 2003 edition that traditional games are in grave decline with the number of hostelries ah, providing... Architects Billingsley. Wisdom. No, you lose five points. The number of hostelries providing a dartboard or bar billiards having dropped by 7% or 12% respectively in the last year. Quickly, come on. Royal Society McWatters. No, it's the good pub guide. Another starter question. What term is applied to telephone dialing executed by means of momentary changes in voltage on the line? The name only coming into use in the early 1980s to differentiate it from the newer electronic tone dialing. Architects Thomas. Pulse. Pulse dialing is right. Here are your bonuses. They're on a social reformer. Which American writer and social reformer born in 1880 said, everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence, and I learn whatever state I may be in, therein to be content? Come on, quickly. We don't know. It's Helen Keller. Which non-partisan organisation was founded in 1920 by Helen Keller and others for the preservation and extension of the basic rights set out in the US Constitution? No idea. Come on. Red Cross. No, it's the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union. According to Helen Keller, what quality is the greatest gift of and at the gong? The architects have 70, the scientists have 125. Uh, well, bad luck, architects. You got off to a good start, but you faded a bit, and you were unlucky in how some of the questions fell out. So I'm afraid we'll be saying uh, goodbye to you, but thank you very much for taking part. Uh, Royal Society, 135, maybe one of the highest scoring uh, eight winning teams. So we may be seeing you again in the quarterfinals. I do hope so. Thank you very much for taking part. I hope you'll be able to join us next time, but until then, it's goodbye from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Goodbye. 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 It's goodbye from the Royal Society. Goodbye. goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>
there are more tough questions to test your knowledge and a look behind the scenes in this special University Challenge book to celebrate 40 years of the programme. Do you think you could see yourself living here? <laughs> oh, my name is... Oh, my name is... <laughs> Come on, Mr Blair. Here we go. BBC Two's taking the mickey tonight in Buzzcocks at nine and Double Take later. Coming up first, a breath of fresh air. Mm, is it War and Peace, Pride and Prejudice or Noddy and His Car? What's your favourite book? To vote for it in the big read, call 090 110 Or vote online at bbc.co.uk forward slash big read. Personally, I've got a thing about the very hungry caterpillar. <laughs> This weekend is an important one for all gardeners, and the Gardeners World team are going to arm you with everything you need to know about your lawn before you venture out. Gardeners World, Friday at 8.30 on BBC Two. A brave soul is moving in with his mother-in-law, not on BBC Two, as three generations of the same family plan their escape to Devon.